Welcome to our program, Inside Yemen, Hunger, Humanitarian Aid, and Hope. We're glad you joined us today for an inside view on Yemen's hunger crisis and how the UN Food Program is feeding and assisting Yemenis and working to build resilience in that area. My name is Marianne Maldonado, CEO of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. We want to give a special thanks to our participating friends that are joining us for today's program, the World Affairs Council of America, the World Food Program USA, and World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Before we begin, let me remind you and mention some of our upcoming summer programs. And additionally, I invite you to view our partners' uh, sites for more global affairs programming also. We still have a few spots available for our Global Scholars Academy. Again, this is for middle and high school students and this summer program will help explore world cultures and international issues and scholarships are still available. We also have um, several upcoming programs on some exciting areas, uh, including Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Morocco, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So check out the Greater Houston's website, as well as our partner organization's websites for more exciting programming and make sure you uh, get involved and get aware. So you can find all of our programs on wachouston.org and then our partner organizations, Dallas-Fort Worth and the World Affairs Councils of America. Now it is my privilege to welcome the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, who will introduce our guest moderator for the program, Liz Brailsford. Liz, welcome. Thank you, Mary Ann, and it's a pleasure to work with you and the Council. Our guests today have done amazing work in bringing international attention to the situation in Yemen and hunger crises around the world. Annabelle Symington is the Head of Communications for the World Food Program in Yemen, working on the ground there since January 2019. She draws on the lived experiences of Yemeni civilians in her writing and interviews on the subject, spreading awareness of the crisis worldwide. Previously, Annabelle was a foreign correspondent working uh, for leading media organizations, including The Times, The Wall Street Journal, BBC, and The Economist. Chase Sova serves as Senior Director for Public Policy and Thought Leadership at the World Food Program USA. Chase has worked in climate change and agricultural development with groups like the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, International Center for Tropical Agriculture, and the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. Focused on uh, agricultural policy, Chase has worked in 15 developing countries across Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. He holds a PhD in political ecology from Oxford University. Sky Fitzgerald is an Oscar and Emmy-nominated director known for his documentaries on international humanitarian crises. He is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. His recent film trilogy covered the lives of refugees in Syria, Libya, and now in the acclaimed hunger ward, those experiencing and fighting famine in Yemen. Moderating today's conversation is my good friend and President Emeritus Jim Falk. Jim served as President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth for 20 years until his retirement earlier this year. He is now co-host of the McQuiston program on KERA. He is always a treat. It's always a treat to welcome Jim to our programs. And I know we are in for a fascinating and enlightening discussion. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. And on that note, the floor is yours, Jim. Great. Thank you so much, Liz and Mary Ann. And it's great to see all of our friends and welcome to everyone, whether it's morning or evening. This is such an important topic. And one of the things that I noticed in preparing for today's conversation is how there really are ebbs and flows in the coverage of Yemen. So we are really fortunate today to have three panelists, three participants who have really focused, uh, focusing on this. So let's go right away to Annabelle, who is on the ground in Sana'a. 
Um, Annabelle, give us a, your perspective of, of what the situation is. I know we're going to be focusing on food and, and, and security, so let's sort of you know st stay concentrated on, on, on that, and then we'll broaden the conversation a bit more with some of the others. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, so, and a pleasure to be be with you all today. Uh, so, the situation in Yemen is commonly referred to as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. That is a um, terrible title that, that Yemen has unfortunately had for about uh, around uh, nearly three years, two and a half to three years now. Right now in Yemen, around half the population, uh, uh, over 16 million people, can't afford enough food to get through each day. Of that 16 million people, you've got 5 million who are on the brink of famine and 50,000 who are already living in famine-like conditions. So what that means is families who are facing day-to-day -day struggles to be able to, to feed themselves, to feed their children. What that means for individuals is you know, mothers and fathers eating less so that their children can, can eat. They're eating less often. They're eating cheaper and less preferred foods. And all of that is having a devastating impact on, on Yemen as a whole, but also children. Right now, uh, around half of all children under five are at risk of malnutrition this year. Now, malnutrition permanently damages the child's uh, cognitive as well as physical development and leads to leads to stunting, which, which is irreversible. So the cost of the hunger crisis that continues to unfold in Yemen is going to be felt not only today by the families who are suffering in Yemen right now, but for generations to come. You know, one of the things that I, I think people need to remember about Yemen is that the country really ever since its establishment uh, has been uh, has been challenged in having enough food. I mean, ninety percent of its food has been imported even before we reach this 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 current crisis. And there's been some other contributing factors as well. Talk about uh, Yemen's, for lack of a better word, really inability to control its population. I mean, its population has grown. 173, 174 percent in the last 30 years, and you compare that to some other countries have been able to do more Planned Parenthood and so forth. Well, Yemen, even pre-conflict, was the poorest country um, on the Arabian on the Arabian Peninsula. So that and and as you as you rightly say, um, even pre-conflict, it was reliant on on imports for for food. It has a very very weak agricultural sector, and that's something which then through the conflict has been has been totally um, devastated. It's also a country that even pre-conflict was plagued by instability, um, political instability, um, which which has meant that um, you know conflict has sort of has sort of come and come and gone. Um, Throughout the decades, the current civil war that is unfolding is actually one of, of many of many parts and many factions. And so, while we commonly refer to the two sides, there are actually many many other players which which sort of further complicate things. But you have a population who were already so even pre-conflict, WFP was was it was in Yemen. We were feeding around one million people even before the conflict, and then through the last six years. We've, we've increased our assistance up to 13 million people. That's not shut. That's that's just below like half half the population. So it's been a rapid, very rapid scale up in order to provide support for for for, unfor for a population who who is who is in dire need of of this ongoing humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. Let me remind everyone that we are eager to hear your questions, and I'll weave your questions into the conversation. So please just put them in the Q&A tab and we'll get to just as many of them as we can. Chase, let's go over to you, if we may. This is a complicated conflict and uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the politics of it because they seem to be changing every day. But where are we? Who are the players? Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. And let me let me start out first by telling you a little bit about uh, who I am and, and our organization and, and um, how we relate to the work that Annabelle is doing. So, so my name is Chase Sova. I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy and, and Thought Leadership at, at the World Food Program USA. And, and WP USA is a nonprofit organization that works in the United States and represents 
uh, some of WFP's interest in the United States as it relates to private sector fundraising, whether it's from individuals, foundations, corporate. Uh, but we also do a lot of work up on Capitol Hill, sort of educating lawmakers uh, on the role that the World Food Program is playing in fighting hunger uh, internationally. So to a certain extent, my job is to try to make Annabelle's job just a, a little bit uh, easier uh, if we can. So um, happy to happy to answer this question. I might I might though for a moment just sort of pull off my WFP USA cap and sort of respond uh, personally to that question. There are a lot of, uh, as Annabelle mentioned, and, and, and you mentioned a lot of political interests here in this conflict. And I want to make sure that whatever I'm relaying here isn't, isn't a company line from, from WFP USA. Um, but there are about 50 active front lines in Yemen right now. So there are many actors at play here. The sort of most recent conflict that we're talking about right now uh, started about in 2014. Uh, there was a disruption of an of a internationally brokered transition of power between former President Saleh and his deputy, uh, a man named Hadi. Uh, now, the Houthis uh, are one of the, the, the groups in this conflict, and they represent about 25% of the population. Uh, you know, they have lived in what is now the course, sort of northern mountain regions of Yemen for, for uh, you know, a millennia. Uh, and the Houthis have been clashing with the sort of Saudi-backed government for decades, but uh, especially since 2004. Uh, the Houthi group or uh, movement was very opposed to U.S. intervention in Iraq at the time. Uh, it called the Yemeni government at that point a puppet of the United States. So there, there are some, some anti-Western uh, sentiment coming from the group. Uh, in 2012, though, uh, we had President Saleh transferring power over to his deputy. Hadi uh, Saleh had been an autocratic ruler who, who was in the country from really since unification in the 1990s and leading that country. But it was a very sort of uh, contentious moment of transition. And, and Hadi uh, really adopted a country that he struggled to keep afloat. There was ongoing attacks from Al Qaeda at the time. There was widespread poverty rampant corruption. We saw uh, rising unemployment in Yemen in that period. And, you know, power abhors a vacuum. And, and the Houthis allied themselves with the former President Saleh and, and took over the capital of Sana'a um, and, and maintained control over much of the country's sort of northwest region. I, I think you have a map up to, to sort yeah, of... This took it down, but yeah. Um, so the war really has been, uh, you know, you could describe the war as a bit of a stalemate since that moment, right? With Iran supporting the Houthis and the Saudi coalition supporting the exiled Hadi government, uh, the country has been experiencing six years of sustained bombing. Now, there have been other political developments along the way. At some point, former President Saleh broke with the Houthis on national television uh, and was killed for that action. Uh, and now the Houthis are involved in a, a sort of full-on battle for uh, the city of Mareb. Uh, and that's the last sort of stronghold for the internationally recognized government uh, toward the east of the country. It's a gateway to the oil fields uh, and to the northeast. It's a major oil refinery in that region. So, you know, ironically, I think we're in a position maybe now where, where peace prospects uh, or, could be underlying conflict at the moment. Both sides sort of unwilling to, to call ceasefire and, uh, until they're in the strongest possible negotiating position on the ground. Um, but you know, this is a very complicated crisis. It's religious, it's geopolitical, it's a proxy war. It is all the things uh, that make peace hard. And it's put the United States in quite a squeeze because of our relationship with Saudi Arabia. It certainly has. Um, a a Annabelle, back to you. How safe are you? Are you able to move around Sana um, freely, or and and how are you providing security for uh, your volunteers and employees? Uh, so we work under you know the framework of, of of the UN, and so you know movements are movements are uh, restrictive. Um, I live on a on a on a compound with all of the other international UN staff who are here. But the real um, backbone of um, our work in Yemen is, 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 is with our, our national colleagues. So we have WFP in Yemen, we have around uh, 100 international staff here and over 800 um, Yemeni national staff working with us. And they really are um, the backbones. So making sure that, that, that they are safe um, as, well, as well as those of us who are flying in and out of the country is absolutely crucial. I do get 
out and about around the country, which is which is amazing. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful country, um, despite the conflicts. I'm sure um, Sky will Sky will be able to attest to as well. Um, but yes, uh, movements are are restricted. We are restricted. Sorry, and we do, we do have to be very careful. We we do move around in armored vehicles. I want to bring Sky in in just a minute, but before we do that, you know, it seems like it's a perfect storm. You have the conflict. You have people who are not able to. Uh, send remittances like they were before because of the uh, downturn in the economy. And of course, we have COVID. And Mary Flo Federer asks, what is the status of, of COVID in Yemen? And it seems like it has, uh, the, the government as well as the Houthis have kept it pretty much under wraps. Uh, yes, uh, COVID, well, testing capacity is very limited here, so it's quite difficult for us to say sort of categorically what the situation uh, is, but, um, you know, just um, in terms of the testing that we are able, that the WHO here is able to do, and then also just anecdotally from what you sit here from the community, um, we're just kind of coming out of what has been a really brutal second wave um, that sort of started around um, March uh, this year. Uh, so almost exactly a year after the sort of first wave, and the second wave did seem um, did seem a lot worse um, than than the first. Um, but unfortunately, you know, for many many Yemenis, uh, the concept of being able to you know, stay at home, socially distant, is it's just not possible. I remember so at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was here and. Um, Speaking to a speaking to a woman at a WFP food distribution point, and I asked her if she was uh, worried, if she was scared of, of COVID, and she started off by telling me that they'd seen worse, they'd, they'd lived through six years of war, and then and then I said, well, but, um, what about you know, are you going to stay home? What are you, um, you know, how are you going to manage this? How are you going to protect your family? And she said, I can't stay at home. I have to go out to work, otherwise. Oh, so what do we do? Do we start or do we go out and? And try to and, and try to continue to, to earn a living, but unfortunately, um, you know that has been a very difficult reality, and many many families have had to have had to deal with that. And, and I suspect vaccines are, are not, not there. Not only the direct one, or they're just beginning. So WHO and UNICEF is just beginning uh, the vaccine rollout. Uh, it's small. It's so far it's small, but there is. Um, through COVAX, the, um, the vaccines are beginning to come, which is obviously a great step. Sky, um, you know, it was touched upon when you were introduced, but this is your third film on human rights as part of a, obviously a trilogy. Um, tell us about how you chose all three topics, if you would. Um, yeah, I... Uh... <clears throat> I, I did the first film of the trilogy called 50 Feet from Syria um, out of a relationship I had with a Syrian American orthopedic surgeon who um, had trained in the US but never returned to Syria. And um, when, the, when the civil conflict started and the uprising started in, in Syria, he wanted to find some way to contribute his own skills as a surgeon. And so um, I partnered with him as an ally and sort of documented his volunteer work as a surgeon on the border of Syria and Turkey, operating on refugees flowing across the border. And that, um, as that crisis only grew and the refugee flow from Syria grew and scaled up, um, I started to talk with many, many colleagues in the NGO field who articulated very clearly how um, once, uh, how the Syrian uh, refugee flow was shifting to the Mediterranean. And that led rather organically into my second project, Lifeboat, where we documented asylum seekers uh, attempting to reach Europe across the Mediterranean. Um, and and when, I, when I was sort of doing my due diligence and thinking deeply at what, about what the third geo location would be for sort of studying uh, the, the global refugee crisis in the region, I really felt like um, Yemen was a story that, that continued to lack traction in the media ecosystem um, for a whole host of reasons, obviously, that is a whole other conversation, I think. But I felt like, specifically as an American, whose government is complicit in the, closet, in the conflict deeply, and that very few Americans know about, 
um, it was uh, a topic ripe for a cinematic rendering um, that could reach people in a different way that wouldn't just immediately um, disappear from the media ecosystem like so many broadcast stories do. And so that's the point where I decided I had perhaps a, a rather unique skill set and opportunity to try to bring this story to specifically a Western audience uh, in a more foundational way, in a way that would have a little more traction and have have uh, a longer a longer lifespan, mm -hmm. frankly. So that was uh, that was the intent and the catalyst. You know, as as we talked about, it's very difficult for the media to get into Yemen. How did you get authorization to do it? Who supported you? And well, so um, I, I I come from a very different position than Annabelle for example, and, and chase you as well, because I, uh, I have both the, um, the opportunity and also the risk to operate in a very different way than an NGO, right? I'm not an employee. Uh, I, I get to make my own decisions about how to build a team and how to go about these things. And, and that's high risk, high reward, right? And so I, I didn't have, um, I didn't have a huge partner to go to the embassy with and say, I'm trying to do this thing, you should allow us access. Instead, I had to uh, navigate very carefully sort of the community of colleagues, journalists, filmmakers who had already successfully navigated that very, um, very challenging landscape of legally gaining access to the country. And I want to emphasize legally, right? Because... <clears throat> As you probably know, there was a CNN team that got into Yemen several months ago and had to go in through the north because they couldn't get the proper permission from the Hadi government. So that that was that was an option on the table for me, but it wasn't one that I wanted to do because part of my paradigm for the film was that I wanted to focus on a clinic both in the north and in the south of the country demonstrate what I thought would be very similar challenges facing healthcare workers and the civilian population, regardless of where they were in the country. And so what I did was we started conversations with the embassy in DC, uh, the, the Yemeni embassy, and that, that set of conversations involved two trips to the embassy, um, a lot of conversations about what we were doing and why we were trying to do it. And there was a... Um, parallel track conversation happening with Ansar Allah, with, with the Houthi uh, de facto government in the north. And, and you know, I, I don't know Annabelle's view on this, but, but my view, having worked in the country for significant chunks of time, is, you know, the Houthis, uh, you know, they are a government. They have their own system of government. They are governing in the north, regardless of how you feel about the nature of that government. And so we really knew that we had to also get permission from them. And so we had a parallel track conversation going with them and we were able to sort of um, somehow make sure that they, uh, those conversations happened and sort of there was a confluence at the very end where we got permission, um, visas from both to enter the country during the same period of time. It was it was nuanced and tricky, uh, and we couldn't really tell either party that we were doing this with the other side. But they didn't ask either, so it worked for us. Well, we don't want to you know give away Hunger Ward because I really do hope everyone watches this film, as I did last week. Uh, how how can people watch it? Tell our audience about how they can watch it for free or they can pay. <laughs> yeah, so Hunger Ward is available right now in about. Uh, 45 countries or so on the Paramount Plus network, if you're a subscriber to that CBS entity, or um, Pluto TV, um, which is a free app for smart TVs. So it is available free or if you're a subscriber to, um, to Paramount Plus. Annabelle or Chase, what do you think has been the response of the film and how has it helped you, if it has, in your work? either one uh, well the film is the film is absolutely uh, beautiful and i think in terms of how it um and, and is led by these two incredibly strong characters a, a nurse and a doc their um, passion and dedication um as yemenis supporting supporting the children around them is is incredibly inspiring and i think really brings the, the human brings out the human element when we talk about the crisis in yemen sometimes the numbers are quite overwhelming we talk about you know 16 million people 
facing hunger, 5 million on the brink of famine, WFP supporting 13 million with food assistance. And then what the hunger war does is, is, is tells you the individual stories behind that. And I think that's what we need to remember. Um, that's also, you know, the great privilege of the work that I do, getting to travel around Yemen and, and meet many of the Yemenis that we are supporting is, is remembering that behind those numbers are mothers and fathers and nurses who are just trying to do their best for their children, for their families, for their colleagues. Chase, Jim, I'm, I'm sure I'm you've got to, uh, an opinion I'm on what's beautiful film piggyback on the back of that from a, a you know sort of u.s uh, visibility and advocacy perspective i mean having a tool like this to put in front of americans is very very powerful um you know annabelle talked about the numbers and how overwhelming they are in yemen and that's absolutely true but globally also we have huge hunger numbers skyrocketing in in, in a multitude of places and so getting media attention on one hunger emergency in the context of of overlapping hunger emergencies is really a difficult play i mean right now around the world we've got about 270 million people who are facing crisis levels of hunger there are just news yesterday that we're seeing increased pockets of famine around the world that incorporate almost 600,000 people uh, in about four to six countries. So the, the, here we are in the 21st century, hunger numbers are on the rise over the last three or four years, uh, and you have these sort of smoldering emergencies like the one that Annabelle is working, but it's, it's stacked on top of emergencies like Syria and Northeast Nigeria, and now Mozambique uh, and Ethiopia. So having a very powerful tool that we can put in front of American market uh, that, that uh, shows those very human stories is, is a very powerful tool uh, when you're trying to break through. You know, and the, the World Food Program has a budget, an operating budget, uh, and needs of about 15 billion with a B this year uh, dollars. And that's a huge amount of money to raise. Now, governments are going to step up and, and, and provide as much as they can, but there's going to be pretty massive funding gaps uh, this year for the United Nations World Food Program. Uh, you know, and if, if you see a, a, a funding gap of maybe $5 billion against what is needed, you know, that's translating into almost 10 billion meals that aren't being delivered by that organization. And so it's a really powerful tool uh, to help us break through what is becoming a, a tragedy on top of a tragedy on top of a tragedy uh, as these hunger tr trends head in the wrong direction. Chase, I don't know what the, <clears throat> excuse me, what the situation is with U.S. funding, and I'd like you to mention that, but I did see that just a few months ago, the U.K. cut its support by 60 percent, and many other countries have as well. Obviously, or not surprisingly, perhaps I should say, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who had pledged money earlier, have, have cut their funding. Elaborate on that, if you would. Yeah, well, let, let me provide a little even more context. I mean, the, the, I mentioned earlier, I spend a lot of my time up on Capitol Hill, and we work with lawmakers in the United States, uh, briefing them and making them aware of the work that WFP is doing, and on the general problem of hunger as it exists around the planet. And, you know, what I can tell you is that there is very strong bipartisan, bicameral support for international food assistance programs in the United States. So the reason that, that in part that we exist at WPUSA is to make sure that that pipeline of funding continues year in and year out. And in any given year, the United States government is going to provide between 30 and 40 percent of WFP's total receipts. And so it's a huge donor, uh, the largest donor in the world in that regard. Um, that funding has been pretty consistent and increasing in recent years in the food assistance accounts. And the food assistance from the United States comes in a couple different forms and a couple different accounts. Uh, it's managed across both USAID and USDA, uh, two federal agencies. So it's a, a sort of complicated thing. But here's, here's what I can say is that both our commodity-based assistance accounts, where we're buying American commodities and shipping them abroad uh, to places in need, and our growing cash-based assistance, uh, both of those accounts have grown or at least remained level in recent years, and we've seen a, a pretty good surplus from Congress uh, in the American Rescue Plan uh, for some international funding for international assistance. So the pipeline, I think, is fairly strong for, for assistance coming from the United States uh, and certainly isn't, isn't waning in this period. 
and didn't necessarily wane over the last four years. And so I think, I think uh, you know, the, the trends are looking good there. What I can tell you looking at USAID's recent uh, report, uh, most of the funding for WFP and other international, uh, other sort of international non-governmental organizations, uh, those, that sort of funding from USAID last year reached about $525 million in support for Yemen. Of that, about $400 million uh, was uh, for food assistance funding going to a variety of organizations, including the World Food Program. So a uh, pretty sizable amount of, of assistance coming from the U.S. people. Well, that's good to hear about the U.S., but was I accurate about other countries reducing and uh, re reducing their assistance? Well, maybe Annabelle's able to comment on that. I, I don't have quite as good uh, finger on the pulse in terms of uh, what other governments are doing specifically in, in the region. Annabelle? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So right now, the situation that we're in is that WFP, um, WFP put out a budget at the beginning of this year where we said we needed $1.9 billion to avert famine. That was the bare minimum that we needed for Yemen to avert famine. So far this year, um, and obviously we're, we're, we're hitting the halfway mark, we've received uh, $937 million, which is good. It's not too bad, but it doesn't get us to the end of the year. And there are a couple of things to, to remember here. So if we look and we compare it to 2020, we have actually so far this year received more um, than we received last year as a whole. And that's where 2020 was an absolutely devastating year for Yemen and actually reversed some of the gains that we had previously made. So we are now pulling people back from famine who we actually, through 2019, had already put them onto a better path. And then 2020, with the huge funding shortfalls that we faced, where we barely got half of what we needed, meant that that coupled with COVID, coupled with an increase in the conflict, and coupled, coupled with a crippling economic um, near total collapse in Yemen, um, that the, 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 by the end of the year, we were seeing pockets of famine again. Now, we're in, a, we're in a better position. Yes, we are racing to avert a famine. And, you know, thankfully, the international community has stepped up so far with nearly half of what we need. But it takes four months to turn a dollar into food on the plate of a Yemeni. When you think about the, in terms of shipping the food, getting it into the country, into the warehouses, and then dispatching it out to the families that need it, from th that dollar pledged by a government to that um, bag of um, f uh, flour being in the hand of a Yemeni mother, turning it into dough for bread for her kids, it's four months. So the fact that we don't have enough, that we have only got half of the year, what we need for the year, when we're at the end of June, means that we do not know beyond September whether we're gonna be able to keep the level of assistance that we need right now. We had to cut assistance last year because our funding was so short. And that was at a time when we knew when, when need was going up. Now we've managed to scale back up to be reaching all, um, all the people who are in uh, famine risk areas, but we don't know how long we can sustain that. So it's an incredibly difficult situation. It's absolutely heartbreaking the, the decisions that the team here is having to make. Sky, I can say after watching uh, Hunger Ward, it encourages one to write a check as well as to write your elected representative to continue to provide to provide support. Sky, you know, it must be such a challenge for you as a filmmaker to reach the right balance between gratuitous, you know, violence or pain versus what people need to see and will not turn off the not turn off the, the screen. It must have been particularly challenging on this film. And I'll let you explain why I said that. Yeah, you know, the uh, the, the tension in the storytelling and specifically the nonfiction world between um, what is necessary, what is important, what is gratuitous, what is not gratuitous. It has been a tension that's been uh, alive and well for generations or millennia, shall we say, um, in different forms. So it's it's not a new question or or challenge, but it's one that I think is um, must be deeply thought upon and carefully considered, especially in when you're filming in the middle of a humanitarian crisis. It's, it's probably 
it, it's a foundational question for me as a filmmaker on any project I do. Um, what is necessary? What responsibility do I have as a storyteller to those I'm collaborating with, um, as well as to a Western audience? And so in Hunger Ward, you know, the reality is, is that it, it, it shot and filmed in a, in a conflict zone, right? Uh, a conflict zone where people are actively dying every day, even as we have this meeting, people are dying. Um, children are dying in the clinics. Um, the, the bombings, despite the negotiations um, that have been talked about before, continue to happen. Um, I talked to a colleague yesterday in the North who witnessed an airstrike himself. So, so that's the context, right? And as, as a nonfiction filmmaker, um, what the first step for me is to learn from those I'm working with what they want, right? Because the, the scenes that you see in Hunger Ward where there are physicians trying to perform CPR on an infant, for example, right? Or there's a mother grieving about the death of her child that happens on camera, right? Those are scenes that we would not be in the room unless we had taken the time to build relationships, not only with those healthcare workers, but with the families themselves. So, you know, the question of consent is the first question, and that's something we care about deeply, and, and it's an active dynamic consent that is ongoing while we're filming. And um, we only include moments like that if we have the full cooperation and consent of the participants. Beyond that, of course, there's the editorial question, right? There's the, there's the question of, is something gratuitous? Is something of value? And, and my approach is that um, I, I deeply believe that we cannot hew to a philosophy that if something is hard to look at, that we shouldn't look at it. In fact, I believe there is such value to seeing the difficult things, to seeing the things that are harrowing and hard for us to understand the real impact of war, for example, right? I think back to images that came out of Vietnam, right? Of the nine-year-old girl being hit by Napalm. Think about the, the, the catalyzing effect an image like that can have. Um, I feel that, that the, the position that I was in as a filmmaker in Yemen was that I had the opportunity because I built the trust with these two facilities and the families, if the families wanted me to, to show the real impact of hunger in Yemen caused by the current conflict. And so in each instance, if a child died in front of us, uh, if the family wanted us to film it, we would film that experience, no matter how intimate. And then we would have a conversation with the family afterwards. And the thing that, that surprised me consistently was that during those conversations, every single time, the families, they almost begged us to include these scenes in the film. And the refrain over and over again was, People need to know. People need to know that I lost my child due to hunger in 2020. Um, and they felt like if people don't know and don't see it with their own eyes, they won't understand what's actually occurring. So that was, there was, a, that was a, a mantle of responsibility that I, that I took and take very seriously. That was a question before us every single day we filmed. Well, it, it, it shows in, in, in how the film comes across. Um, you know, congratulations. Um, let's bring in a question from Ray Termini, and this will probably go to you, Annabelle. Uh, please explain the refugee problem in Yemen. He says, I understand that millions of Yemenis have been displaced from their homes, and that as well, Yemen continues to host refugees from Somalia. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um Around 4 million Yemenis, um, that's out of a population of around 30 million, have been displaced by, by conflict. Um, for many of them, more than once. So often I meet, when I'm out in, in, in camps, meeting families who have been displaced two, three, four times um, by, by the conflict, each time life getting harder and harder. And then on top of that, Yemen remains a country which sees a many... Um, people fleeing from um, conflicts in West, in um, Eastern Africa. Um, so Ethiopian, Somali, Somalis, um, South Sudanese, 
um, coming on boats um, across to Yemen, and they are trying to get to Saudi Arabia generally uh, for work. Um, but they get tied up in a in a brutal in a brutal conflict here, um, and unfortunately, many also die on the crossing. Just last week, um, a boat carrying um, around 200 migrants—that's the estimate, because actually no one knows—sunk um, just just off the coast of Yemen, um, killing nearly everyone on board. Um, so it is an incredibly, um, incredibly difficult uh, situation for for, the, for these migrants. WFP does support does support them in in camps as well, as well as the IDP, the internally displaced um, population, who um, are a are a sort of absolute priority group for us in terms of the food assistance that we provide. And in terms of the way we provide that assistance, we do two things: um, rapid response. Uh, rations to families who have just been displaced. So that's where we are making sure that families within seven days of them being displaced, that we are getting ready to eat food. So things that they don't need cooking materials in order to be able to eat. So it's sort of canned foods um, that we're getting to them within the first seven days. Um, and we're doing that in coordination with uh, UNFPA and UNICEF and UNHCR. So we provide a whole package where they get shelter, hygiene kits, and then the food from WFP. And then after that, we're looking to, to get them onto our monthly food assistance um, as quickly as possible. And that's where we're delivering um, uh, staple foods. So we're delivering flour, pulses, uh, oil, um, sugar, and salt. Um, and making sure that, that then on a monthly basis that they are that those uh, IDP populations are, are receiving that. Jim, could I build on that just for a second? Of course. Um, so so um, in addition to what Annabelle just articulated in terms of the larger context, you know, we, um, because we were in the field the entire time we were there, we pursued stories in many parts of the country. And we spent some time in a small uh, town called Al Azra on the Western coast of Yemen, which is one of the landing points for immigrants coming across the, the Red Sea from the Horn of Africa. And um, in addition to what Annabelle articulated in terms of the challenges of both IDPs and, and external asylum seekers entering Yemen to try to make their way up the West Coast to, in, to enter Saudi Arabia, there's a whole nother uh, community of traffickers that has developed along the West Coast of Yemen, which is an incredible problem right now. What happens is that um, there are uh, Eastern African traffickers who are who have, are now working with, with Yemenis, with Yemeni traffickers, who as soon as asylum seekers land um, in Al Azra, for example, they're met by a truck and they're loaded into a truck and driven about 10 kilometers away to what's called a hooch. And they're essentially held and trafficked for a period of time um, until they can receive funds uh, via, you know, via Western Union, via Venmo, via mobile apps, in order to be released from this imprisonment. And so it's turned into a trafficking ring, much like Libya has, where this human displacement has been exploited um, into human trafficking. And and I, I interviewed several of these asylum seekers who had landed in El Azra, and then who are actually in a clinic that World Food Program was supporting. And one of them had just been released the day before. And I won't go into the details now, but but the experiences that human being bore and somehow survived before he was released simply for being an asylum seeker are so harrowing and so horrible that we should all care. It's happening actively right now. It just shows the ramifications of this conflict on so many levels. Walter Ulrich has an, uh, a really interesting question. Uh, it's one of the things that I know you all are well aware of, that a lot of the foreign assistance goes on the black market, is stolen, pilfered. And Walter asks this, Medical Bridges is very concerned about the healthcare infrastructure in Yemen, where uh, Medical Bridges has served before. Do you, either of you have any advice on how we can get medical equipment and supplies safely, legally, and assured it will get to those in need. Annabelle, perhaps you should take a stab at that. Uh, well, in terms of um, well, the, the the need on the medical on the medical side and healthcare side is is absolutely critical. You know, that only half of all healthcare facilities are currently fully functioning in Yemen. Um, 
as a result of the as a result of the conflict. Definitely getting. Um, I, I don't have advice on this particular, like how to get this, you know, medical equipment in, because that's not, unfortunately, not my, uh, not my area. But w, you know, WFP does support, um, you know, WHO with it with its medical supplies. But I'm not sure what the best way for individuals to be getting supplies in. Unfortunately, into the north, um, you know, the the airport is closed. And so the only um, main access point sort of to commercial um, air travel is through is through Aden uh, in the south. Um, but you do see the greatest levels of need in the north. So I'm sorry not to be able to answer terribly effectively, but um, it's, it's certainly a, a need to be concerned. Sky, since you spent so much time in various hospitals and health facilities, how did you see the level of care and equipment? Um, well, the, to, to me, I would separate those very, very clearly, uh, care and equipment. Um, the care is there. The, the, the ability to treat uh, severe acute malnutrition cases and moderate acute malnutrition cases is there because the medical workers really, truly care and are committed to that care. The problem is that, um, as Annabelle has, has articulated, is that it's incredibly difficult to not only get supplies to these facilities of all kinds, including food, but, but it's, it's also hard for the medical workers themselves to, um, to sustain themselves, right? Um, because, uh, you know, in the North, in some cases, physicians haven't been paid for two years. Um, at least government physicians. And so they have to find some other way to feed themselves as well. Um, and in the South, there are similar problems um, in, at Sadaka Hospital, which is sort of the, you know, the magnet uh, malnutrition unit in the entire South of the country. Um, they, you know, they have a hard time retaining staff because they're, you know, Thankfully, the World Food Program and, and other UN agencies do supplement the, the, the salaries and the staff of, of, of those physicians there. But, um, you know, they, they work very long hours um, and they've been, they've been working very long hours for over six years now. And they don't see um, a decrease in the cases. The, the volume that's coming to them on a daily basis is only increasing. And... It, the level of staffing they have right now is unsustainable. And so people burn out, right? Um, and they also need to be able to feed themselves and their family. And, and if their salaries aren't coming consistently as well, because sometimes they're funded by uh, UN agencies, sometimes, and we've talked about the funding challenges there, sometimes they're funded through UAE groups, right? And that funding is inconsistent as well. So um, the, the ability to treat difficult cases exists, and yet um, the the consistent resources aren't there to support their work. Let me bring in a question from Lena Kumar, and as well as Lynn Simino, and I'll combine the questions. Lynn asks, what other humanitarian organizations are working in Yemen? I'm sure there's probably too many for you to, to list. And Lena says, how do you work with other agencies uh, or each other to have an impact in Yemen? How do you work with your local partners? Thank you both for those questions. Annabelle, I suppose you'll probably be the best to respond to those. So the humanitarian response here between all of the different partners um, is, is incredibly linked up. So it's actually run through a series of what we call clusters. Um, so we have, for example, the food security cluster, we have the nutrition cluster, um, we have a telecommunications cluster, uh, the logistics cluster and so on and so forth. And, and those clusters are made up of the likes of WFP, the other UN agencies like uh, UNICEF and WHO, as well as the major NGOs, you know, be it Oxfam, Save the Children, uh, Islamic Relief, uh, NRC, DRC, just to name a few. And so it's through those clusters that we are able to make sure that things are well coordinated. So, for example, um, WFP leads on both the telecommunications and the logistics cluster. So that's kind of a 
in some ways a sort of a, an area of WFP that not everyone knows is that actually we're, we're the logistics backbone of not only the Yemen humanitarian response, but also the humanitarian responses all around the world. Um, and then we're also um, leading on the food security with, with FAO, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization. And so that's ensuring that assistance is, um, is, is just well coordinated and that we're making sure that everyone who is in need is, is being reached and that there is no sort of dupl duplication. Um, so it's, it's through that. So, for example, when it comes to uh, the food security cl cluster, and that's the one that comes up with the fact that around 13 million people, just under 13 million people, need monthly food assistance, they then say, right, how do we how do we divvy up that um, that caseload? Um, and actually, the way it falls is that WFP itself ends up with um, 12.3 million of that uh, nearly 13 million, and then the and then the, the rest is is actually between other partners. So WFP doing the uh, absolute lion's share when it comes to the food security. Um, on the nutrition side as well, um, so WFP supports um, mothers, so pregnant or feeding mothers who are malnourished. And then we support the children who can be the malnourished children who can be treated as outpatients. So, so ones who can we can give nutrition supplements to, and they can go home um, and take these supplements. Um, and then UNICEF and WHO are the ones who are supporting the children who are so malnourished that they need hospital treatment um, for, for for the malnutrition. So again, making sure that we are coordinated and so that everyone get the right type of assistance at the right time it is absolutely crucial and so you know, and well great question from your from the audience so thanks so much for asking that it's, it's well it's great to hear important. as well that people are working agencies are working well together you know we have just a few minutes and i want to share with the audience and annabelle ask you to expand on this i was not aware of this organization called the ipc uh, the full name is quite a mouthful but integrated food security phase classification and it's a website where you can type in a country and then it will show you what the levels of food insecurity are. Would you tell our audience more about that? So, because I, I think they will find it really interesting to, to see just the, the, the scope and the degree of food insecurity around the globe. Absolutely, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, so the IPC is is an organisation um, that uh, WFP is a, is a leading part of, but we are working with um, both other UN agencies as well as um, NGOs in order to um, do needs-based analysis so of, of hunger needs. So in a crisis like Yemen, um, we our goal is actually to do um, on-the-ground surveys every year to be able to get an accurate um, picture of exa the exact hunger needs. So the last IPC for Yemen came out at the end of last year. Unfortunately, we'd actually had a two year gap between the um, between uh, that that one and the one before because of just the challenges of operating in a, in, in, a, in a conflict environment like Yemen. But we are in the process of doing an update. Um, so our survey, um, the survey teams who it's a huge network we're talking thousands of people um go out um, throughout the country door to door doing household surveys where we're asking questions um around um, things like dietary diversity so are people only relying on you know one or two food groups or are they able to to get full range of um you know of of um of uh, diverse diet um where and how are they paying where are they getting food and how are they paying for it or are they borrowing it or having to rely on food assistance and then the kind of coping strategies that they're having to resort to if they are hungry and it's through that that you would have a famine declaration um, if it was required and so actually a famine declaration requires some very very high levels of um, a sort of burden of evidence so you have to be able to show that um, there were food con a certain level of food consumption gaps, so at least 30% of the population facing um, acute food consumption gaps. You have to show that at least 20% of children are malnourished and that people are dying of hunger. Now it's that last one that in a conflict environment like Yemen that is actually very hard to, sh to definitively prove that people are dying of hunger and not causes related to the conflict or that were that 
in some ways hunger is exacerbated, but it might not actually be the thing that is that is taking the life. So that's where a famine declaration, which is which would come through the IPC, um, is actually in a in a context like Yemen would always be incredibly difficult to get. And it's important that within that to remember that. You don't need to wait for famine declaration because people are already dying. And it is actually their deaths that would trigger the famine declaration, not the other way around. So I think um, just to remember that the situation in Yemen is critical now and we really can't wait for it to get any worse. And as the evidence of the IPC and it's incredibly, the incredibly important work that it does um, shows that um, the level think- of need already is so high. I think what's important from what you've said is that when you read that there is a famine declaration or emergency, that this is not just built on someone's emotions, based on someone's emotions, but it is factually based research. And you have to realize that this is you know, clearly a, a factually based. So all of you and, and, and Sky, I saw an interview you did a, a few weeks ago and you talked about donor fatigue or conflict fatigue. Uh, Paul Joy says, do any of you see a future where Yemen is prosperous and can become stable? Um, Annabelle, again, uh, you're on the ground and then I'll go to Sky. Uh, well, I um, I work closely with, with my, you know, my Yemeni colleagues on a day-to-day basis, and they're some of the most inspiring, motivated people that I've ever had the privilege to work for. So I have to have hope, because they, they still have hope. But um, right now, the international community needs to stay engaged in Yemen. We need to continue to put pressure for a sustainable end to the conflict. And until that day comes, we need to be there providing assistance because we need a, you know, emergency food assistance to save lives today and then an end to the conflict to, to save lives and, and put Yemen on the path to a sustainable future. And we can do that for peace. We need peace. Sky, you've been on the ground there. Do you agree? I do agree. And I think there's hope and in individual effort as well as the organizations that, that Annabelle, you and Chase are a part of. Um, these are the organizations and the people that give, that give me hope, given what I saw. My, my, my overarching concern, uh, and it's a thought I would like to you know, leave everyone with here today, is that, that I, I think we have a global issue in that starvation is being used as a weapon of war, and it's starting to be normalized in the modern world. Chase mentioned Ethiopia and Syria earlier, in addition to Yemen, right? There's three examples that are, all the evidence is there, where... Um, starvation is being used as a weapon of war. And um, I I think we have to be very careful as a global community to make sure that doesn't continue to be normalized. It's the catalyst for why I did Hunger Ward in the first place. It, you know, our paradigm was a film called Seeds of Destiny, which was done in 1945, post-World War II, which aimed to raise awareness around famine in Europe, right? And how many children were dying in to raise funds for the organizations, the early predecessors of the UN, right? Who were doing that hard humanitarian work to rebuild Europe and to save people from famine. Well, Sky, I hate to cut you off, but I wanna give Chase the last word. Chase, hopefully people are motivated to do a little bit more research on this issue. How can they support you and the US food yeah, you know, and, and just to piggyback on what Sky and Annabelle said before I give you that information, I mean... Uh, and I give you 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Uh, you know, the, the, I have a lot of hope looking at what the, the, the U.S. government and the way that members of Congress are thinking about this conflict. It is, again, on people's radars in very important ways, and I think that there's a, rec- there's a recognition among members and staff up on Capitol Hill where it matters in the United States that of the link between food and conflict, uh, and, and the, the food is a, as a sort of underpinning of so much instability uh, that we see around the planet today. So I'm optimistic on that front. Uh, easiest way to learn about what Annabelle is doing uh, from a U.S. perspective is to visit WFPUSA.org. Uh, that's uh, the World Food Program USA's website. You're going to see all about Annabelle's opportunity, uh, what's happening in the country there. And there's some opportunities there to get involved, whether it's giving or sharing on social media platforms and trying to Good. build uh, awareness for this. Emergency. Thank you so much, Chase. Annabelle, thank you, Sky.
want to again encourage everyone to take a look at Hunger Ward. It'll be time well spent. And Liz, back to you. Thank you. Thank you all for such a wonderful conversation on a critical topic. I know our members walked away from this session with uh, more knowledge and a better understanding of the crisis. So thank you. I'd also like to uh, thank the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston again for partnering with us on this program. It was presented as part of the Engage America World for Food Program USA speaker series supported by the World Food Program USA and the World Affairs Councils of America. Thanks to both of these organizations. And we have a full schedule here at Dallas-Fort Worth. So check out our website at df wworld.org. And as mentioned a few minutes ago and at the, uh, at the top of the program, check out our partner uh, organizations websites as well for information about this uh, topic and also for their calendar of events. Thanks to all of you and have a great day.